Welcome to the first lecture of three, first part of three lectures on electrolyte solutions. And in particular, over the course of all three, we're going to be re reviewing and working problems that involve milliequivalents and millimoles and end up with milliosmoles. For this first lecture, though, we're just going to emphasize on really defining and getting the fundamentals reviewed of milliequivalents and millimoles. So with that as an introduction, let's get started. The first slide here is a review of a discussion of electrolytes and kind of defining the chemical activity we assign to electrolytes. So, so a review is that the molecules of chemical compounds in solution either remain intact or they can dissociate into separate ions. These ions carry an electric charge. And the reason this is important is that when we do calculations on IV products and a lot of hospital type products, we are focusing on the electrolytes that need to be replaced or adjusted or included in our IV solutions. So electrolytes are things like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Okay, those are the cations that we use in our electrolytes. They are often coupled with anions that include things like chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, or sulfate. Okay, and those are the ones listed there. And they can come in different combinations. For example, we can have calcium chloride, or we could have calcium phosphate. You know, a lot of times we have uh, sodium uh, chloride and potassium chloride, uh, but there are all sorts of different permutations that we can have. So what's important to understand is these molecules, these more complex molecules, just as shown maybe on the right-hand side in the picture for sodium chloride. So what we can see is with the solid crystal is what sodium chloride comes with initially as a solid, but when you put that solid into a liquid, it dissociates. And that's the form that it's in in the body is the sodium and the chloride are dissociated into their separate ions. And again, sodium is a cation with a positive charge and chloride is a negative ion with a or an anion with a negative charge. Okay, and and they're dissociated. What's really important here for this lecture is that when we could count those millimoles, which is a measure of the number of molecules, we can count those molecules. But when we're trying to define chemical activity here, it's really important that we look and understand that each one molecule may or may not produce the same amount of electricity. They may not expose the same valence because different ions have different charges. So in our example here, sodium and chloride each have a single charge. That is, sodium is a positive one charge and chloride is a negative one charge. But let's say you had one sodium and you also have one calcium. Well, they're both positively charged and they're both just one molecule, but sodium produces a one positive charge, but calcium has a positive two charges. So in our terms of a chemical activity, we would say that calcium has a higher chemical activity because it exposes two charges. And again, we are looking at electrolytes and defining their contribution to the, to the body in terms of the amount of electricity they generate. So we measure that activity in the, in the units of milliequivalent. So the second bullet point defines and says that the milliequivalent, abbreviated little m, capital E, little q, so M-E-Q, that unit is often associated in what we use to express the concentration of electrolytes in solution. So instead of just stopping at the number of molecules, because different electrolytes can have different valences, the actual amount of chemical activity for the same number of molecules is different. So we go beyond just counting molecules to counting a melli equivalence, or equivalence, in this case we'll call it in the melli units, and to be able to... <clears throat> account for this. So again, the definition listed here, to make sure I read this right, it just say that this unit, the milliequivalent unit of measure, is related to the total number of ionic charges in solution because it takes into account the valence. And therefore, we're taking this this electrical charges to be the measure of the chemical activity of the electrolyte. So hopefully I made my point to take home. <clears throat> The point for all of this is, is you can count molecules, but the same number of molecules don't produce the same amount of electrical charge and therefore don't have the same degree of chemical activity. So we can count Melli equivalents as the measure of the units that we'll measure to determine this level of chemical activity. Okay, That leaves us then three things that you really need to be comfortable converting between. That is the idea of milligrams millimoles and milli equivalents. And you can see they all have the word milli in there. So what is the difference between a milligram, a millimole, and a milli equivalent? 
Okay, so the take home point is the key element that we're gonna that you need to keep in mind when converting between the weight of an electrolyte in milligrams. So milligrams is a measure of the weight of an electrolyte. And it's chemical activity, which we just finished defining as being measured in milliequivalents. To convert from weight to electrical activity, you have to take into account two very important things. That is the number of molecules, which we determine by counting the number of millimoles, and also factoring the valence or the charge on the ions. Okay? So... Before we go on and we'll practice this, we'll see that milligrams with a abbreviation MG is a unit of weight. Millimoles, which is abbreviated M-M-O-L-E, millimole, or is the measure of the unit of the count of the number of molecules. Whereas milliequivalents or MEQs will be the units that we use to measure the electrical activity, which will account for the valence and essentially record the number of electrical charges produced by that amount of ion. Okay, those are key things you need to separate in your mind and understand because we're going to be converting from one to the other. And so I've given you an example here for calcium. And on top, what I'm showing you is where we can start with weight. So on the far left on top, we're starting with 160 milligrams of the calcium cation. Okay, so 160 milligrams. We have the weight of calcium. Okay we can convert that to the number of molecules because hopefully you remember, we've already defined that the number of moles, one mole of a substance is equal to its formula weight. Therefore, one millimole of a substance is equal to the formula weight in milligrams. So what we would do to convert from 160 milligrams of calcium to the number of millimoles is multiplying by the fact that every one millimole of calcium is equal to 40 milligrams of calcium because 40 is the molecular weight for calcium. Units of calcium, I'm sorry, units of milligram would cancel, and we're now under the number of millimoles. And up above in red for millimoles, remember, all we've determined is the number of calcium molecules. We've got converted from the weight of those molecules to simply counting the number of molecules, because one millimole, or the when we're in the units of millimoles, we're counting the number of molecules. Okay. But we said that different molecules can different have different valences and therefore have different relative amounts of electricity and then chemical activity. So the units of chemical activity or electricity is milliequivalents. So to convert from the number of molecules, that is millimoles, to the number of, uh, number of milliequivalents, we place the valence factor with the milliequivalents. Since the charge on calcium, as you can see on the molecule, is a positive 2, that valence number, the 2 for the valence, gets where you place place that with the milli equivalents. So calcium has two milli equivalents for every one millimole. For every one molecule of calcium, you get two charges. There are two uh, sets of electricity. So there are two MEQs for every one millimole. That's key that you understand that. It's not difficult. You just take the valence number and associate it with the milli equivalents, and that's the number of milli equivalents you would get for one millimole. This way, millimoles cancel, and we end up, as you can see on the far right, in terms of eight milli equivalents of calcium. Okay, that's the equivalent. Remember, we use the blue valence to convert from the number of molecules to the amount of electrical activity or chemical activity, and that's the unit of milli equivalents. Okay? What I show you on the bottom is how you can take that same number and work backwards. And that's what I'm saying. You really must understand how to convert your units from step to step to step. And then you can answer all of these questions I'm going to show you here in a little bit. So let's say on the bottom left, you're starting with eight mel equivalents of calcium and want to know how much weight of calcium is, is equivalent to that. Well, we would start with the eight MEQs of calcium, which is the equivalent weight, and we would need to convert that to the number of molecules that produce that amount of electricity by factoring in the valence. So we would multiply that by the fact that every one millimole of calcium is equivalent to two MEQs of calcium because the valence on calcium is two. So two MEQs for every one millimole. You can see doing it this way, the, t the MEQs of calcium cancel, and now we're in millimoles of calcium. Well, we can convert from the number of molecules to the weight by multiplying by the fact that the 40 milligrams or the formula weight of calcium in milligrams is equivalent to one millimole of calcium. Millimoles cancel, and if you multiply across, your final units would be milligrams of calcium, and you can see that's where we would get the number we started with, essentially, which is 160 milligrams. So, 
I think this is an important beginner slide to understand this is how you either convert from weight to equivalence or from equivalence to weight. And these are the steps you have to go through and the cancellations you have to do to get one to the other. And true, make sure that you really understand that so that that's key for being able to set up the problems that we're going to now work on. Well, let's apply all of that knowledge now and answer our first question. And it reads, the normal potassium level in blood is 17 milligram percent. Express this concentration in terms of milliequivalents per liter. And we're given the additional information that potassium, or K+, plus, it has a molecular weight of 39 and a valence of 1. So, where do we start with this? Well, let's get rid of that funny 17 milligram percent. Those are units I'm not exactly sure I can deal with for my conversion. So the first thing I would do is restate the 17 milligram percent. And remember, percent simply refers to per 100. And again, since we're talking about its concentration in blood, that would mean essentially 17 milligrams of potassium per 100 milliliters of blood. So 17 milligram percent is the same as 17 milligram potassium per 100 milliliters. So on the bottom, on the far left, that's where we will start. That's the concentration we were given. And what we're trying to do is simply convert our units. I don't want my potassium in milligrams. I want it in millimoles. And I, or I'm sorry, in milliequivalents. Well, I don't want my milliliters on the bottom. I want liters. So again, in the end, I want milliequivalents over liter. So we can convert either of those to begin with, but let's start with the milligrams of potassium. Let's first convert from the weight of the potassium to the number of potassium molecules. We do that by multiplying by the fact that there is one millimole of potassium has 39 milligrams of potassium because 39 is the molecular weight. Milligrams of, can of potassium cancel, and we now have millimoles of potassium. We need to convert from the number of molecules, millimoles, to the number of milliequivalents. That is the electrical charge on that. So what we would do to convert that is since the valence of potassium is 1, we can say that there is 1 milliequivalent of potassium for every 1 millimole. And that's because the valence is 1, so it's 1 milliequivalent for every 1 millimole or molecules of potassium. Therefore, millimoles of potassium cancel, and we're in milliequivalents of potassium, which is great on top. The last thing we have to fix is to get rid of the milliliters in the denominator. So let's multiply everything by 1,000 milliliters on top per liter. That way, milliliters cancel, and my final answer will be per liter. So if you do all that math from left to right, you should get the value of 4.36. And the last remaining units would be milliequivalents of potassium per liter. And that's the, another way of re-expressing that same potassium level. So 17 milligram percent, which is expressing it as a weight per 100 mils, is the same as 4.36 milliequivalents, which is an expression of its chemical activity, per liter. Next question. Let's see. We're going to determine the milliequivalents of an ion from a compound this time. A little more complicated. So it says, a potassium supplement tablet contains... 2.5 grams of potassium bicarbonate with the formula shown and a molecular weight of a 100. It wants to know how many milliequivalents of just potassium are the, being supplied by this tablet. So we have the weight of a compound, and what we want to know is the chemical activity or milliequivalents of potassium that that compound provides. All right? So let's start on the far left here. We're going to start with the weight of the potassium bicarbonate, which was 2.5 grams. Okay. The first thing I'm going to do here is convert from grams to milligrams. So I multiply by 1,000 milligrams of potassium bicarbonate per gram. So my grams cancel. I'm now in milligrams of potassium bicarbonate. Now, let's convert from the weight of the potassium bicarbonate to the number of molecules of potassium bicarbonate by multiplying by the fact that one millimole of potassium bicarbonate is contained or has a weight of 100 milligrams because the formula weight of potassium bicarbonate is 100. So one millimole over 100 milligrams. And now my weight of potassium bicarbonate cancels, and I'm in bear with me on this, the number of molecules, that is millimoles, of potassium bicarbonate. What I need to do now is convert from the number of molecules of potassium bicarbonate to the number of molecules of potassium 
To do that, I have to look at the formula. How many potassiums molecules are in one molecule of potassium bicarbonate? Well, the formula is KHCO3, so there is one millimole of potassium for every one millimole of potassium carbonate. Every molecule of potassium bicarbonate only has one molecule of potassium. And conversely, if we were trying to determine oxygen, for example, we would actually have three millimoles of oxygen for every one millimole of potassium bicarbonate because looking at the formula, it's KHCO3, three oxygens for every one molecule of potassium bicarbonate. But in this case, <laughs> I'm just not trying to confuse anyone here, we are about potassium. And since potassium bicarbonate, KHCO3, only has one potassium molecule in it, we can go from millimoles of potassium bicarbonate to millimoles of just potassium based off of the formula. So now that we've canceled our units of millimoles of potassium carbonate, we just have the count of the number of potassium molecules. And then lastly, we can convert from the number of molecules to the amount of chemical activity, i.e. metal equivalents, by m multiplying by the fact that since the valence of potassium is 1, there is 1 MEQ of potassium for every 1 millimole of potassium. Millimoles of potassium cancel, and our final units would be in milliequivalents of potassium. If you multiply that all the way across, your value should be 25, which means that 2.5 grams of potassium bicarbonate provides 25 milli equivalents of potassium. All right, let's kind of do another example of this very common sort of calculation where we're determining the milli equivalents of an ion from a more complicated compound. And in this question, we want to know how many milli equivalents of lithium are provided by a daily dose of four 300 milligram tablets of lithium carbonate. And I give you the formula here as Li2CO3 as the chemical formula for lithium carbonate and that it has a molecular weight of 74. Mm -hmm. So where do we start? First, we got to figure out how much lithium carbonate we have by weight. Then we can convert that to the number of molecules and then we can convert that to its electrical activity. So let's start on the far left with the fact that our daily dose has four tablets. So we're going to take four tablets multiplied by the fact that there are 300 milligrams of lithium carbonate per tablet. So tablets cancel, and now we're in the milligrams of lithium carbonate. Then we can convert to the number of molecules of lithium carbonate by multiplying by the fact that one millimole of lithium carbonate, there would be 74 milligrams since the molecular weight is 74. Now my milligrams of lithium carbonate cancel, and I'm in millimoles of lithium carbonate. That is the number of molecules of lithium carbonate. Remember, I want the chemical activity of just the lithium. So I have to convert from lithium carbonate to just lithium. So that's why you need to look at the formula. The formula is Li2CO3. Therefore, every one molecule of lithium carbonate provides two molecules of lithium. Okay, so what I end up multiplying is by the fact that there are two millimoles of lithium for every one millimole of the parent compound, lithium carbonate. And the two millimoles come from the fact that there are two lithiums in the chemical formula of lithium carbonate. That way, millimoles of lithium carbonate cancel, and I really am now in just the count, the number of lithium molecules. Lastly, to convert that to the chemical activity, I'm going to multiply it by the valence. So the valence on lithium is one, so there is one milli equivalent of lithium for every one millimole. Therefore, millimoles cancel, and my final units will be milliequivalents of lithium, which is the chemical activity of the lithium. Do the math from left to right, and you should get a final answer of 32.4. And the units would be milliequivalents of lithium. So four tablets that each contain 300 milligrams of lithium carbonate in the end would provide 32.4 milliequivalents of lithium based on its formula weight, converting it to molecules, then converting it from the parent molecule to the lithium molecule, and there are two per each molecule, and then multiplying it by one because the valence of the lithium is one. So hopefully you can follow that through step by step and see how we got that answer. All right, let's move on to another problem, and it reads, Percogesic Backache Pain Relief Caplets. Now, don't get that confused or excited about Percocet. It's not Percocet. It's Percogesic, which is available over the counter, as it contains 580 milligrams of magnesium salicylate tetrahydrate with the formula shown there and with a molecular weight of 370.59. Okay? Now, the question is, 
how many milli equivalents of magnesium will a patient receive each day if they take the normal analgesic dose of two tablets by mouth three times a day? All right. So looking at the formula here, what we've got is uh, an electrolyte, if you will, where we have magnesium as the cation and this salicylate as the anion. Okay, and it's a tetrahydrate, meaning four water molecules. So it's a complex molecule, but it will dissociate into those three things, magnesium and salicylate and tetrahydrate. And so what we want to know is if we take these tablets, how much magnesium will I get in, in terms of mele equivalents per day? So one, let's do one quick calculation before I show my results here. If the patient takes two tablets three times a day, then the total number of tablets per day would be two times three or six tablets per day. So let's just keep that in mind because I'm going to start answering this question by the fact. That let's start there where we see that the patient is taking six tablets each day. So we'll take six tablets times the fact that there are 580 milligrams per tablet. So tablets cancel and we're now in milligrams or the weight of my magnesium salicylate tetrahydrate. Let's convert that to the number of molecules by multiplying by the fact that there would be one mole of magnesium salicylate tetrahydrate over its formula weight, which is we said was 370.59. So now my milligrams cancel and I'm in the number of molecules of the parent compound. But what I want to determine is the number of mele equivalents of just magnesium. So I first have to convert from the number of molecules of the parent compound to the number of molecules of magnesium. So let's look at the molecular formula. We see though that the parent molecule, magnesium salicylate tetrahydrate, only contains one magnesium. So we'll multiply by the fact that there is one millimole of magnesium for every one millimole of the parent compound, magnesium salicylate tetrahydrate. So now those many millimoles cancel and I'm in just millimoles of magnesium. Now I'm one step away to convert that to milli equivalents. So let's multiply it by, and this is where we gotta take a step here and look at magnesium and see that the valence on magnesium is actually a plus two or a two valence. So I'm gonna multiply this by the fact that there are two milli equivalents of magnesium for every one millimole of magnesium. Millimoles cancel and my final units are magne I'm sorry, milli equivalents of magnesium. And if I do that math from left to right, my final answer would be 18.78. And again, that would be the milli equivalents of magnesium. This patient would uh, get each day from taking six tablets of the perkagesic tablets. Okay, next question is about an eye drop. So it's editate disodium, often abbreviated EDTA, and it has the formula given there, and it is a dihydrate, as you can see, in a molecular weight of 336.21. Now, EDTA is kind of an interesting molecule. It's a chelator. It binds things. And so it's used in an eye drop to kind of help remove calcification or plaques that occur in the cornea, or sometimes as an eye wash. If you splash nasty stuff in your eyes, you can use this kind of EDTA eye drop to kind of bind and help remove stuff and remove it from being in contact with the eye. So anyways, that's what we have in this eye drop. The question really wants to know how many mele equivalents of sodium are contained in a 10 milliliter bottle of a 3% solution. Okay. I like this question because it also makes you go back and be able to use your knowledge of concentrations and percents. In this case, 3% represents a 3% weight per volume concentration. So where do we start? Well, we want to know how many mele equivalents of sodium are in this 10 milliliter bottle. So let's start with the volume of the bottle, which is 10 milliliters. We will then multiply that volume by its concentration. We were told that the editate disodium has a concentration of 3%. And since that's weight per volume, the units are grams per milliliter. And since it's a percent weight per volume, that means it's grams per 100 milliliters. So 3% means 3 grams per 100 milliliters. So when we multiply that across, milliliters cancel. And I'm now in grams of my EDTA. So let's convert that to milligrams by multiplying by the fact that there, does, there is a thousand milligrams per gram. So that grams cancel. I'm now in milligrams. Now I want to convert to the number of molecules of EDTA by multiplying by the fact that one millimole of EDTA would have its over its molecular weight of 336.21. That way milligrams cancel. And I'm now just in the number of millimoles or molecules of EDTA. 
So now I need to stop and take a second and actually look at the formula because what the question wants to know is the mill equivalence of just sodium. So now I'm in the number of millimoles of my parent molecule, editate disodium. I need to know how many molecules of sodium will be in each one molecule of the parent compound. So if we look at the formula, we can see that it's a disodium, and you can see it's Na2. So that should make sense that we're going to get two sodium molecules from every one molecule of editate disodium. So I multiply it by the fact that there would be two millimoles of just the sodium ion over one millimole of the parent compound editate disodium. Now the millimoles of the parent compounds uh, cancel, and I'm now in just the number of millimoles of sodium. One step away, let's look on the valence of sodium. Sodium's valence is a positive one. So I'm going to multiply that by the fact that there would be one mele equivalent of sodium for every one millimole of sodium. Millimoles cancel. If I do that math all the way from left to right, my numeric value would be 1.78, and my units would be mele equivalents of sodium. And that is the answer to this question. All right, let's do, a, I won't say more complicated, but a little more onerous question because we're going to have to do this multiple times with variations here. So the question says, how many mele equivalents of potassium are represented in a solution that contains all three of the following products? And I won't read those to you, but the fact is that we have a half a gram, 0.5 gram of potassium acetate and also half a gram of potassium bicarbonate and half a gram of potassium citrate. Okay, so you'll notice we have the same starting weight of each of those three compounds. So the intuitive question is, will all of those compounds provide the same number of mele equivalents of potassium? And I think you're going to find that the answer is no, but it isn't just because there are differences in molecular weight, it's also because there are differences in the number of potassiums in each of those molecules. So let's kind of go through those one at a time and we can just solve it out, but comp we'll compare our answers in the end. Okay, and I'll start to try to do these a little more quickly because they really do work the same way. So on the far left, I start with my 0.5 grams of the ca uh, potassium acetate. Then I convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Then I convert to the number of molecules of potassium acetate by multiplying by one millimole on top over the 98 milligrams, which is the formula weight. I'm now in the number of molecules of potassium acetate. But I want to convert that to potassium, so I look at the chemical formula and see that there is one potassium for every one potassium acetate. So I'll multiply by one millimole of potassium over one millimole of potassium acetate. Now I'm just in millimoles of potassium, and I can convert that to mele equivalents because the charge on potassium is one. So there's one mele equivalent for every one millimole. And now all of my units cancel except for mele equivalents of potassium. If I do that math from left to right, I get 5.1. Okay, so that's the amount, number of mele equivalents of potassium I'd get from just my potassium acetate. Well, what do I get from my potassium bicarbonate? Well, I'll start with my half a gram there, convert it to milligrams, then convert it to millimoles by dividing by its formula weight, which is 100 milligrams. So now I'm in millimoles of potassium bicarbonate. Again, now looking at the formula, there is still just one potassium for every one potassium bicarbonate, so it's a one-to-one. -one. I can cancel my moles, millimoles of potassium bicarbonate, and I'm in millimoles of just potassium. And again, the valence is one, so I multiply by one milli equivalent for every one millimole of potassium, and I get five milli equivalents, which is almost the same answer as I got for the potassium acetate. The only difference between these two has to do with the formula weight. For, again, is a little bit less for the potassium acetate than the potassium bicarbonate bicarbonate, but otherwise you get essentially the same chemical activity when you start with the same amount essentially of those two products. Now let's see a difference. Let's look at the potassium citrate. So we'll do the same formula the same way. We start with half a gram of potassium citrate. We convert it to milligrams and then we'll convert from the weight of milligrams to the number of millimoles by dividing by its formula weight. And you'll see its formula weight here is much larger at 324, but that converts it to the number of millimoles of potassium citrate. Now we're gonna multiply it by the fact though that there are three potassium molecules in every one molecule of potassium citrate. So we have to have three millimoles of potassium on top over one millimole of the potassium citrate. Now we're in millimoles of potassium. We can still convert that to milli equivalents by multiplying by the fact that there is one milli equivalent of potassium for every one millimole because the valence is one.
Now you multiply that across and you can see that the final answer here is 4.6. So certainly different than the first two, but it's offset a little bit by the fact that while you have three potassium molecules for every one molecule of potassium citrate, the, the molecule itself weighs almost three times as much at 324. So that's why, again, those are the two things that will affect the uh, total amount of milliequivalents that you get from that. In the end, to answer this question, it wanted to know how many milliequivalents of potassium. Does it really matter where the potassium comes from? No. So let's just add it all up. So let's add the 5.1 from the potassium acetate plus the 5 from the potassium bicarbonate and add it to the 4.6 from the potassium citrate. And when you add all that together, the total amount of potassium milliequivalents would be 14.7. All right, let's do something a little bit different here. We've been going from weight and determining milliequivalents. Let's kind of go the other direction and also factor in some different valences here. So the question reads, you need to prepare an electrolyte solution that contains 4.6 milliequivalents of calcium that has a molecular weight of 40 per liter. Okay, so it's 4.6 milliequivalents of calcium per liter. How many grams of calcium chloride with the formula of CaCl2 times 2 H2O, so it's a dihydrate, so calcium chloride dihydrate with a molecular weight of 147, how many grams of that should be used to prepare 20 liters of the solution? Okay. Once again, there seems to be a lot of things going on here, but let's start with how much are we trying to prepare. The amount of calcium we need is going to be the amount to prepare the volume we want to make, and we want to make 20 liters. So we start this question simply by starting with 20 liters. And what is the concentration of the solution I'm trying to make? I want 20 liters of a solution that has 4.6 milliequivalents of calcium per liter. So if I multiply those together, my units of liters will cancel, and I'm now in the milliequivalents of calcium I need. All right? Now I want to go from the electrical activity of that amount of calcium to just the number of molecules, millimoles, that provide it. So let's multiply that by the fact that every one millimole of calcium has two milliequivalents. And that two, again, comes from the valence of calcium. Calcium has a positive two. Therefore, there are two MEQs for every one millimole. And we put millimoles over two milliequivalents of calcium so that the units of milliequivalents of calcium cancel, and I'm now in the units of millimoles of calcium. But keep in mind, I'm wanting to weigh a certain amount of calcium chloride dihydrate. So to do that, I need to convert from just calcium to the number of molecules of calcium chloride. So I'm going to multiply that by looking at the formula. There is one calcium molecule for every one calcium chloride molecule. So I put one millimole of calcium chloride on top over one millimole of calcium. There's a one to one. Now my units of millimoles of cal calcium cancel, and I'm in the units of millimoles of calcium chloride. Okay, and it really is the dihydrate. I'm not including that in here, but we really are talking about molecules of calcium chloride dihydrate because now that matters because we're going to convert from the number of molecules to the weight of those molecules. So I'm going to say that the molecular weight of calcium chloride dihydrate is 147 milligrams and set that over that the formula weight is equal to one millimole of calcium chloride dihydrate. Those units cancel and I'm now in milligrams of calcium chloride dihydrate. Last step is to convert that to grams by multiplying by the fact that in one gram there is over 1,000 milligrams. Milligrams cancel and if I do my math now from left to right my final unit will be grams. So doing that math you should get 6.76 as your number and the units are going to be grams of calcium chloride dihydrate. So this goes to show the process of starting with milliequivalents and working backwards to come up with a weight. And in this case, the weight the units was in grams. All right, let's do another question. It says, a patient is receiving an intravenous infusion of 5% dextrose and 0.45% sodium chloride with 3.1 grams per liter of potassium chloride. And that IV is being infused at a rate of 100 milliliters per hour, and they're going to get it for a total of 24 hours. How many potassium chloride tablets, called with the brand name of Cater, containing 1490 or 1,490 milligrams of calcium, uh, I'm sorry, potassium chloride, should this patient take to receive the equivalent dose of potassium? Wow. What are we doing here? We're infusing this IV with a certain amount of potassium over this 24 hours. 
we need to figure out how much potassium they're getting from that IV so that we can then convert and decide how many of these cater tablets will provide the same amount of potassium. So let's start by first looking at the IV infusion and determining how much potassium this person is getting from the IV infusion. And again, where do we start with that? Well, we want the amount of potassium they're getting from this IV infusion over a 24 hour period. So let's start with the 24 hours, okay? For 24 hours, we're gonna infuse this IV at a rate of 100 milliliters per hour. Doing this, my units of hours cancel and I now have the total volume infused over 24 hours. Uh, my units are in mils. Now, what I can do is take the concentration I was given of potassium in this IV, which was 3.1 grams per liter. Let's express that quickly for the sake of time here in just milligrams per milliliters. So 3.1 grams is the same. If we multiply that by 1,000, that's 3,100 milligrams. And a liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. So the 3.1 grams per liter, I've re-expressed here as 3,100 milligrams of potassium chloride per 1,000 mLs, and I did that so my milliliter units will cancel, and I'm now in milligrams of potassium chloride. I need to convert that to the number of molecules. So let's multiply that by the fact that one millimole of potassium chloride would have 74.5 milligrams, since that's the formula weight of pot uh, potassium chloride. I'm now in the millimoles of potassium chloride. To convert that to just millimoles of potassium, I multiply by the fact that there is one molecule or one millimole of potassium for every one millimole of potassium chloride. And lastly, to convert to the chemical activity in terms of milliequivalence, multiply by the fact that the valence of potassium is one, so there is one milliequivalent of potassium for every one millimole. So there's lots of little steps in there. I even kind of cheated a little bit with the milligrams per milliliters for the concentration. But all of those units cancel going across, and we end up in just mel equivalents of potassium. And the number numerically going across there you should get is 100. What does that mean? For a 24-hour infusion at the rate we're infusing it at and the concentration of potassium in the bag, we are essentially giving this patient a total over the 24 hours 100 mel equivalents of potassium. That's the amount of potassium we want to give in our cater tablets. So the next step is to start with that amount of potassium. That is, we want to give 100 milliequivalents of potassium. So how many tablets do we need? Unfortunately, we know the amount of potassium chloride in the tablets by weight. We know there are essentially uh, 1490 milligrams per tablet. So we got to take our 100 milliequivalents of potassium and convert it back to milligrams so we can compare it to the tablets. So let's just do it. 100 milliequivalents of potassium times the fact that in one millimole of potassium there is one milliequivalent since the valence is one. Then we can convert from millimoles of potassium to millimoles of potassium chloride because there's one potassium in each potassium chloride. So now my units cancel and I'm in millimoles of potassium chloride. I can convert those into the milligrams of potassium chloride by multiplying by the formula weight, which is 74.5 milligrams for every one millimole. So now I've canceled millimoles and I'm finally in the weight of milligrams of potassium chloride. Getting to that point converts my 100 milliequivalents potassium into milligrams of potassium chloride. Lastly, to determine the number of tablets, all I have to do is multiply by the fact that in one tablet, there is 1,490 milligrams of potassium chloride. I did that so that milligrams of potassium chloride cancel, and my final units going from left to right will end up being tablets. So do that math all the way across, and your final answer should be five, which means five tablets of this potassium chloride the cater tablet, will provide essentially the 100 mil equivalents of potassium that they've been getting in their IV fluid. And that ends this question. All right, next question. And I don't know, maybe it's me, but I, all this discussion about mil equivalents is making me hungry. So I'm looking forward to this question because it says, a person taking a diuretic is advised to eat a banana daily. A banana contains approximately 140 milligrams of potassium per ounce. How many milliequivalents of potassium would be consumed in a banana weighing 120 grams? All right. Other thing we need to know is that the molecular weight of potassium is 39. And for this conversion, we're going to say that one ounce is equal to 30 grams because we're going to have to make that conversion. All right. So what are we doing here? We're going to consume a banana. 
and that banana is 120 grams. How much potassium is in that 120 gram banana? All right. Well, let's start with this. We've got a 120 gram banana. Let's convert to how many ounces because what's a little bit tricky about that is I know the amount of potassium per ounce. So if I've got a 120 gram banana, I can multiply that by the fact that in every one ounce there is 30 grams. So the units of grams cancel and that would tell me how many ounces is provided by my banana. Then I can take that weight of the banana and convert it to the weight of just potassium in the banana. I multiply that by the conversion of 140 milligrams of potassium per ounce. My units of ounces cancel, and I'm now in milligrams of potassium. Quick fix, let's convert from the weight of potassium to the number of its molecules by multiplying by the fact that one millimole of potassium would, be, would have 39 milligrams of potassium, since that's the formula weight for potassium. Converts, and that cancels my milligram units, and I'm now in millimoles of potassium. Last step is to convert from the number of molecules to the amount of chemical activity by multiplying the fact that it has a valence of one, so one MEQ of potassium for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel, and my final units would be milliequivalents. And if you do that math all the way from left to the right, you would get 14.4 milliequivalents of potassium. That's how much you get from eating a 120 gram banana. All right. Well, let's say this person is tired of eating bananas. I don't know why. I love bananas. But anyways, they're tired of using bananas. So the next problem says, how many milliliters of a 10%, and that would be a weight per volume, potassium chloride elixir would be needed to provide the same amount of potassium? Now, the molecular weight of potassium chloride is the 74.5. So again, instead of eating the banana, let's get the same amount of potassium from this 10% solution. Where would we start? Well, we'd start by the amount of potassium we want to get from this solution, which we just calculated to be 14.4 mL equivalents of potassium. All right. Where do we need to go? We need to get back to an equivalent weight of potassium chloride so I can calculate the volume I need from my 10% solution. So we got to start all the way at the backwards with the mL equivalents, 14.4 mL equivalents. Let's convert that to the number of molecules of potassium by multiplying by one millimole of potassium for every one milli equivalent of potassium because the valence is one. Mill equivalents cancel. I then convert from the millimoles of potassium to the millimoles of potassium chloride by looking at the fact that every one millimole of potassium chloride, there's one potassium in every one molecule of potassium chloride. So that will cancel my millimoles of potassium, and I'm now in millimoles of potassium chloride. Now I can convert that to the weight of that amount of potassium chloride by multiplying by the fact that there are 74.5 milligrams of potassium chloride for every one millimole, since 74.5 is the molecular weight. My millimoles are now canceled, and I'm now in the weight, that is, in milligrams of potassium chloride. The next step, though, is to convert that weight to grams. And you'll see why here in a second. But let's multiply it by the fact that there's one gram of potassium chloride for every 1,000 milligrams. That way milligrams cancel, and I'm now officially in grams of pota uh, potassium chloride. Why do I need to know how many grams of potassium chloride? Because I was told the liquid we're using is a 10% weight per volume. What are the units for weight per volume? Grams per milliliter. And since it's a percent, it's grams per 100 milliliters. So what I want to do is cancel my grams and convert it to volume. So I'm going to multiply it by the concentration expressed as for every 100 milliliters on top, there would be 10 grams of potassium chloride. And hopefully you have learned in this course by now how to set up these percent weight per volumes and use the and cancel whatever units you want so that you can convert from either weight to volume or volume to weight. Here we wanted to convert from our weight in grams to a volume. So multiply by 100 mils on top over 10 grams of potassium chloride. Grams of potassium chloride cancel and our final units would be milliliters. So if you do that math all the way across from left to right, you would get a final numeric value of 10.7 milliliters. 10.7 milliliters provides the same amount of potassium chloride as we get from our one two, I'm sorry, one 120 gram banana. So in closing, we finished all of the questions we're going to answer in this, this lecture. But in closing, I want to emphasize this, that Mele equivalents and the measure of chemical activity using Mele equivalents are only used for electrolytes. 
at electrolyte compounds such as the sodium chloride or the potassium chloride or the calcium chloride, and hopefully you're starting to see there's not that wide a variety of the electrolytes that we do these sorts of calculations with because in medicine and in pharmacy, there's only certain electrolytes we typically have to replace or manage um, with disease states and so forth. So, But for those, we do use electrolytes to determine the amounts of sodium and calcium and phosphate and all of those things. It's very important. Okay, But most drugs are not dosed by equivalents. These are really reserved for electrolytes. And remember, electrolytes are primarily replaced in the body or involved in the body with things like electrical conduction, cardiac conduction. So they're extremely important, but they're kind of a narrow focus. There are lots of other drugs we give that have nothing to do with electrolytes or cardiac conductions or electrical conductions and impulses and all of that. Those drugs are not going to be expressed in mel equivalents. We're going to typically express them in their weight, potentially maybe their units of activity, but their weight. Okay, so don't get confused. Drugs are not dosed by mel equivalents. Electrolytes are dosed by mel equivalents. However, the one caveat that's kind of interesting is that there are some drugs. Well, I was just say, most drugs are often salts. And so sometimes the salt, a big parent molecule, might be coupled with a hydrochloride. Okay, or a phosphate. So there may be a phosphate molecule that comes along with the drug, but the drug itself is not dosed, or the chemical activity of the, is not expressed for the drug in elect, is in mel equivalents. Okay, but you can say there is a certain amount of potassium or sodium that comes along with some of these molecules. There is carbenicillin and disodium. Well, there's two sodiums that come along with every carbenicillin molecule. So you could calculate the amount of sodium or potassium. Or in the example here, each potassium, or I'm sorry. Sorry, penicillin V potassium, which is a commercial product, penicillin V potassium tablet that contains 250 milligrams of the penicillin also contains 0.17 mL equivalents of potassium because there is potassium that comes along with the tablet. So you might at some point need to be able to quantify how much potassium or electrolyte comes with these drug molecules, but the drug molecules themselves are going to be dosed off of the weight of the parent compound. And lastly, this problem down below, it's an interesting one. It says, can there be mel equivalents calculated of chloride or fluorine from these drugs? So we have the clobetasol and the ciprofloxacin. Look carefully. For the clobetasol, you can see fluorine, fluoride molecule as a part of that. Okay? Over on the ciprofloxacin, you can see chloride, you can see the fluoride as well. Okay. So the question is, in these molecules, could you actually calculate the mel equivalents coming from those molecules? And the answer is no, because they are not electrolytes. They are covalently bound into that molecule. So they're not going to dissociate. They're not going to separate from the parent molecule. Therefore, there won't be any chemical activity coming from those actual ions because they're not ions. They're covalently bound to those molecules. So just remember, we use a, we use mel equivalents as really the measure and, and dosing for all sorts of electrolytes, but they don't, that doesn't translate to the dosing for the majority of our drugs. So hopefully that was clear and hopefully you found this lecture useful.